I'm David Tursivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Capitalist society is particularly in need of stories. Our everyday lives are defined by going to school and to work, caring for our kids, listening to gossip, having a laugh, and stressing about this or that. Yet all of these micro interactions take places within a set of larger structures and relationships whose primary purpose is to make a profit. The vast majority of people go to jobs that were not created to meet human needs, but to give the owners of capital a return on their investment. All of us, wage earners and capitalists alike, are locked into a system designed to perpetually accumulate more and more profit, not to satisfy human needs or provide for the common good. This is a strange way of organizing society. It goes against our nature as social, mutualistic beings. Yet for capitalism to survive and thrive, people must willingly participate in and reproduce its structures and norms. Coercion and duress work to integrate the poorest and most desperate members of society, but they are not sufficient to ensure the generation of profits in the long term. Large swaths of the population must actively, or at least passively, believe that capitalist society is worth their creation, energy, and passion that it will provide a sense of meaning, and that it meets their need for justice and security. That was written by Nicole Askoff in her book, The New Profits of Capital. As we've discussed, whether in episode 22, Fashion Victims, or 36 and 37 on Slavery, those who find themselves at the bottom rung of our global supply chains are often exploited directly through violence, coercion, and other forms of enslavement all to fuel consumer and economic growth in the world's richest countries. But for those of us in those richest countries, being physically and mentally removed from these unpleasant origins of our supply chains, we are still fully integrated into the broader economic and political structures that enable this violence. We're not merely beneficiaries of global capitalistic accumulation. We are inseparable cogs. But we don't directly choose this arrangement. None of us, or very few of us, would be led to a slave pit in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or a slave boat off the coast of Hawaii, or a ruined habitat cleared for an Indonesian palm tree plantation, and then say, yes, I'd like to maintain these things so I can continue to spread palm oil butter on my waffles for breakfast. You know, none of us actually wants to live in a world where cheap commercial knickknacks are delivered to our door for the modest price of global environmental destruction, inevitable economic collapse, brutal slavery, violence, and war. And so, to prevent us from rising up against this system, to keep us from joining hands and channeling our anger or our uh, dissatisfaction into some collective action to overthrow it, we are told stories. Stories that make us feel good, that make us believe that the lives we live in the context of this system are actually contributing positive things, that the goods we purchase save the world, that the modern state of the world is an inevitable and an unavoidable reality, and that the violence and destruction all around us are not products of the current system, but rather it is our economic system that is actively working to end these unfortunate realities. These are some of the stories that we're told. Central to the perpetuation of these stories is the idea of philanthropy and charity. At the behest of these narratives upholding the capitalist hegemony and extolling us to place our faith in modern economic growth, are men and women telling us that through our charitable contributions and generous living, we can change the world. That by supporting billionaires with vision, these rich philanthropists who have decided to give back who will put their heart and soul into righting the wrongs of global inequality, poverty, and global warming, well, then we can save the world. Okay, well, uh, all right, David. Um, why don't we visit the mind of one of these great philanthropists, uh, one of the founding fathers of modern philanthropy, if you will. And to do that, why don't we go back in time to the Gospel of Wealth, written by Andrew Carnegie in 1889. 
So, David, I want to read you some of the thoughts uh, from Carnegie in this Gospel of Wealth. And, and of course, Andrew Carnegie was a, a great man of industry that helped build up uh, the American economy back in the day, had a steel monopoly and all that. And I think it's really revealing what his thoughts are on the purpose of this wealth and how it should be used. And uh, obviously, philanthropy is something he was known for, and he discusses a little bit about his uh, uh, thoughts on that. So let me read you some of the things that he talks about. Sounds good. Um, so he, he begins his essay talking about how there's this great problem of the day, and that's the way that wealth is distributed. Okay. Inequality, you know, I can get behind that so far. Right. And he says that through proper administration of wealth, the, quote, ties of brotherhood may still bind together the rich and poor in harmonious relationship. Um, and he goes on to say that when he was visiting the Sioux, a Native American uh, nation, he says, I was led to the wigwam of the chief. It was just like the others in external appearance. And even within the difference was trifling between it and those of the poorest of his braves. The contrast between the palace of the millionaire and the cottage of the laborer with us today measures the change which has come with civilization. This change, however, is not to be deplored, but welcomed as highly beneficial. It is well, nay, essential for the progress of the race, that the houses of some should be homes for all that is highest and best in literature and the arts, and for the refinements of civilization, rather than none should be so. And then he, he closes that thought off with, but whether the change be for good or ill, it is upon us beyond our power to alter and therefore to be accepted and made the best of. It is a waste of time to criticize the inevitable. All right. So that's kind of how we're getting started off with Carnegie's thoughts on wealth, David. Wait, wait. So let me let me simplify and summarize there because uh, there's a lot of wigwams and things. So what he's saying is, yeah, you know, back in the day, we all lived in more or less the same house, and that's fine. But I would rather have some baller ass house that has like the best art ever created, and for other people to live in squalor. And that is one of the words that he used. You you left that that part out of your quote because at least then somebody's benefiting from all of this uh, wealth, and we are forwarding society and civilization because this stuff is being created for somebody even if that means only a small amount of people are, are able to, to enjoy the benefits of that. Well, you know, I think it's even deeper. I think he's legitimately saying that civilization as a whole benefits from this divide. And maybe he's even implying that the, uh, those men and women who live in squalor today are actually better off than they would be you know, living in, in the type of relationship that the Sioux people had, right? Are, are we talking about Andrew Carnegie or the IMF right now? Because they really sound pretty much the same. We'll get to the IMF, David. Don't worry. <laughs> but you know, he, you're right. He has like two premises here that I think are quite questionable, which is one, that the divide between rich and poor is natural. It's inevitable and therefore, quote, beyond our power to alter, right? Um, and then the second is that, like what you said, this divide is essential and good for civilization. Uh, so let's keep that in mind. Let me read some more things from this essay for you. Today, the world obtains commodities of excellent quality at prices, which even the generation preceding this would have deemed incredible. The poor enjoy what the rich could not before afford. What were the luxuries have become the necessities of life. The laborer has now more comforts than the landlord had a few generations ago. Okay, so yeah, you see, David, he's actually saying that the poor are better off than, uh, than they previously were. Yeah, and were. that slums are a sign of progress over wigwams. Exactly which the IMF just totally ripped that off, I guess. Yeah, something we talked about in episode 23, Best of Times, how this kind of is like a central narrative, like one of the stories that we're told that upholds capitalism, that, oh, yes, we have slavery, yes, we have environmental destruction, but it would be far worse had we not created this system of uh, profit accumulation. And I think one thing really stands out to me, too, where he's talking about the quality of life being better today or in his day in, in the 1800s, because of essentially what are commodities, right? And that's another thing we hear a lot that we talked about in that Best of Times episode, that life is better because you can go to the store and purchase uh, a comb for 25 cents, whereas 200 years ago, that comb would have been $500 because it had to be made through some special material, like yay, yay industrialization. Well, I've even heard that turned around on this very essay. So, I mean, this was written in 1889, 130 years ago at this point. 
But I've heard people today suggest that even the poorest American alive right now lives a life that's more fantastic than anything Andrew Carnegie could have imagined because they have a microwave and they have a flat panel TV. And if they save enough money, they can fly on an airplane to somewhere. And that means that materially, they're better off than Carnegie is. And to those people, I always say, like, have you been to one of the Carnegie houses and seen how that man lived? Like, go, go check out his what is basically a palace and then say that again to me with a straight face. But <laughs> yeah, OK, sure. He couldn't make microwave popcorn in three minutes with a bunch of burnt kernels. But it didn't matter because he had a whole team of chefs and slaves basically making stuff for him. But I'm getting uh, beside the point here. Well, the microwave, David, we might consider one of the benefits of civilization. But those benefits come with a price. And, and Carnegie has something to say about that. He goes on. The price which society pays for the law of competition, like the price it pays for cheap comforts and luxuries, is also great. But the advantage of this law are also greater still, for it is to this law that we owe our wonderful material development. But whether the law be benign or not, we must say of it, it is here. We cannot evade it. No substitutes for it have been found. And while the law of competition may be sometimes hard for the individual, it is best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. We accept and welcome, therefore, great inequality of environment, the concentration of business, industrial and commercial, in the hands of a few, and the law of competition between these as being not only beneficial, but essential for the future progress of the race. And so this, this is kind of his uh, rationale for that premise that we discussed earlier of how this divide between people is a good thing, because competition is what drives innovation and civilization forward. Yeah, I mean, this was the social Darwinist idea at the time that was in vogue because of, well, you know, Charles Darwin and his work in biology, uh, which was shaking the world at the time. But since then, we have 130 years basically disproving the fact that that this is not how things actually work, that there seems to be really little correlation between the wealth of somebody and their capability or fitness. Um, there is, however, a dramatic correlation between their success in life and the wealth that they're born into. Uh, but that's another conversation and something we've talked about before. Well, and it's uh, something we see today a lot. I mean, the idea of ideas, the marketplace of ideas. Yeah, these ideas, even though they've been disproved, have not gone away. I, I, I want to make that clear. Well, we're going to see this idea come up again because kind of like a spoiler alert here, but the modern philanthropists of today cling tightly to this idea of competition and the faith that is put into it in terms of uh, how we're going to solve some of the greatest problems in the world through charitable giving and philanthropy are often so tightly connected to the idea of competition. But we'll come back to that. I want to read something else that he wrote where he says in this Gospel of Wealth, quote, the socialist or anarchist who seeks to overturn present conditions is to be regarded as attacking the foundation upon which civilization itself rests. For civilization took its start from the day that the capable, industrious workman said to his incompetent and lazy fellow, if thou dost not sow, thou shalt not reap. And thus ended primitive communism by separating the drones from the bees. Daniel, I'm not even sure exactly how to respond to all of this, uh, because in everything, especially in this essay, I mean, in everything Carnegie writes, but really this essay, there's this just overwhelming arrogance that I know what's best. And and I mean, he goes on, he'll use a phrase a lot like those who have studied a subject and things like that, uh, implying that he's the only one who has the, the expertise and the experience and the breadth of knowledge to really speak with authority on these subjects. I mean, he is. I guess, probably still controlling for inflation, the richest person uh, who has ever lived in modern civilization. I'm sure there's, you know, the, the king of ancient Persia had more wealth. But in terms of, of a non-royal individual, he is probably the wealthiest person who has ever lived. So, I mean, maybe we should take his perspectives on accumulation of wealth and the horrible things he had to do to, to achieve that. Uh, maybe we should listen to that. But how to spend that wealth in a sustainable way and, and how to talk about society as what's best for it. I'm going to take everything with a little grain of salt. And here, I mean, the way that he talks with such confidence about the way that civilization inherently assembled itself, it's this very old idea that, I mean, here he's talking about 130 years ago, but it continues today. And that's that civilization is this sort of 
unavoidable progression of logical events and each one was going to happen and we had to move in a single way in order to get to civilization where it is now and without any of these very obvious things the uh, creation of property the fact that some people are going to work harder and we should reward them for that uh we look at it as obvious and that's how we got here today but there are so many examples especially when you start digging into various groups and types of people and moments in civilization that show that these just aren't true even if they are simple assumptions to make uh, they've been disproved just so many times. Uh, maybe he didn't have the anthropological breadth of knowledge or research available to him at the time to realize that this is the case. Um, and having only the hubris that he has in his inherently very specifically American Western perspective of things. And, and to be fair to Andrew Carnegie, he was against a lot of uh, European models of accumulation of wealth. He hated the British aristocracy. Um, he suggested a lot of inheritance laws and taxation because he hated the way the aristocratic method would reward what he felt was lazy and incompetent people. So, I mean, he was trying to put his his money where his mouth was, so to speak, and quite literally many times, but he was just wrong so much. It's really hard to respond to a lot of these things. Like, what are you supposed to say besides just, this is not correct because you just don't know so much? Well, I think it's it's so important to read because of how deep these ideas are held by the wealthiest people in our world today. And you see that where he separates people into drones and bees. And we, we see that today with the separation of people into winners and losers. And what is the criteria? So often it's the criteria is, well, who's making profit? From Carnegie's perspective, his lens, and so many of the modern billionaires of today, a life is only valued so much as that it's making money. Yes. Though, though I, I want to point out that a lot of the language that they use isn't explicitly about profit. Like even here in Andrew Carnegie's essay, he says, if thou dost not sow, thou shalt not reap. The implication is that those who work hardest are rewarded. But even in his time, and it's very much true today, work and the amount that we work and how hard we work is very poorly correlated with how much we succeed and how much wealth we generate. Some of the wealthiest people in the world don't work a day of their lives. I mean, 60% of the wealth in America is inherited. So the vast majority of it is inherited, not created from from this mythos of work. And I know so many people who are basically one missed paycheck away from being on the streets who are working 80 or 100 hour weeks with multiple jobs just to get by. Right. Like that's like half of all America. Exactly. And but 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 as you point out, this myth still persists. If you hustle hard enough and we have this hustle culture going on, then you will succeed. And it's just it's never been true, despite how much. These billionaires, these philanthropists, these entrepreneurs today would like it to be so. And uh, even going beyond, though, like if hard work correlates with wealth, there's another interesting way to look at this. David Graeber puts it really interestingly when he writes in 2013 from an article in Strike that became the impetus for his book, Bullshit Jobs. He writes, in our society, there seems a general rule that the more obviously one's work benefits other people, the less one is likely to be paid for it. An objective measure is hard to find, but one easy way to get a sense is to ask, what would happen were this entire class of people to simply disappear? Say what you like about nurses, garbage collectors, or mechanics. It's obvious that were they to vanish in a puff of smoke, the results would be immediate and catastrophic. A world without teachers or dock workers would soon be in trouble. And even one without science fiction writers or ska musicians would clearly be a lesser place. It's not entirely clear how humanity would suffer were all private equity CEOs, lobbyists, PR researchers, telemarketers, bailiffs, or legal consultants to similarly vanish. And, and I love that question because, like you're saying, hard work doesn't necessarily correlate with uh, wealth. And what David Graeber is saying is wealth itself doesn't even correlate with value to society. The most highly paid and richest people in our world today oftentimes do work that we wouldn't even miss if they disappeared. Meanwhile, the people who are doing the work that keeps civilization running, the actual people doing work that progresses civilization that Carnegie is so fond of, are these people that are paid barely nothing. The real question, Daniel, is what would happen if you and I disappeared? We have the world would crumble, David. Come on. <laughs> I know your world would crumble if I disappeared. Here's, uh, here's Carnegie again, David, quote, These are the highest results of human experience, individualism, private property, the law of accumulation of wealth, the law of competition. 
unequally or unjustly perhaps, as these laws sometimes operate, and imperfect as they appear to the idealist, they are nevertheless, like the highest type of man, the best and most valuable of all that humanity has yet accomplished. So it should be no surprise, I think, to anybody listening, Daniel, that a man who accumulated this vast amount of wealth would decide that the four highest achievements of humanity is... Uh, Private property, of course. Private property, (laughs) uh, competition, accumulation of wealth, and of course, because he doesn't want anybody fucking with him, individualism. It's unsurprising that somebody would be like, oh, yeah, you you know what's with the best... Four things about any person is Daniel. Number one, if they're named David. Number two, if they have brown hair, uh, but like a very specific shade that I just happen to have the exact one. <laughs> uh, number three, if they have a show called Ashes Ashes. And number four, if they're living in New York right now. Anybody who achieves those four things is the highest pinnacle of man. And everyone else uh, is a gutter trash. That's basically what Andrew Carnegie is doing here right now. As ridiculous as that sounds, he really is. And he's trying to attribute these four things that he either wants or allowed him to accumulate this huge mass of wealth, either as as fundamental laws of nature, of things that have always been there and, and that he discovered and civilization discovered and allowed him through some divine right, because this is a natural way of the world working to accumulate all this massive amounts of wealth and power. Or he's just trying to redefine what he sees as as the world that he's living in right now to play into his exact rules. And in a large part, he succeeded in doing that, partially because of his outsized influence, because of his wealth. And also some of these thoughts, uh, they, they appealed to a lot of other people who had this wealth and power or who wanted it. And today, I mean, we still hear these ideas from this essay echoing, like you've mentioned, in these ideas of philanthropy and, and even beyond that, in, in general ideas of entrepreneurship and the accumulation of wealth and the fact that it is an innately good thing. And it is a religion of sorts here in the United States, especially. Yeah. And like you said, he believes these because that's who he is. And we should examine our own society and who do we look to in terms of our leaders and our idols? I mean, We have a president right now who's a billionaire. We have people like Elon Musk, these billionaires that we put our faith in terms of progress for civilization. People like Bill and Melinda Gates, who are billionaires that we look to in terms of solving some of the greatest problems in our world. But when you look at the psyche of, you know, what they believe, it's really self-serving. But more importantly is how resistant naturally a person like this is to anything that threatens the very fundamental structures that enabled that wealth accumulation in the first place. So here's Carnegie writing, uh, he continues, he says, but even if we admit for a moment that it might be better for the race to discard its present foundation, that is all those laws that he just said is the highest achievement of man, that if it is a nobler ideal that man should labor, not for himself alone, but in and for a brotherhood of his fellows and share with them all in common, Even if it were good to change, we cannot know. It is not practicable in our day or in our age. (laughs) And so this is the question we have to ask when we look at these billionaires is, who do these messages benefit? This man that's sitting atop the highest rung of the, the largest economy of his day is saying, well, look, even if a better world were possible, it's just not practical. How convenient, right, David? I There's so many responses in this essay, I just don't even know how to reply to. It's it's such a, a very specific foreign way of looking at the world uh, compared to my own experiences. But it's something that I do encounter day to day. And when I meet these people, I always just throw up my hands and I walk away because I, it, I, don't, I don't know what to say to someone. How can you explain to somebody anything when they see the world so differently than you, where they take these very basic truths that time and time again, experience has shown are not truths or anything but they're cultural constructs at the very most. And just assume that because this is the way things are, that's the way they always have been and always will be. And that's the best way it can be because they have this this very loose faith that uh, the fact that this is the way things are is a product of some sort of larger market. And so therefore, the best ideas survived. And we are living in that world right now. The only thing that can improve upon that world are, I don't know, technological innovations or something, because culturally we have reached a peak and there is no improvements because there's nothing to improve upon because this is not 
it's not a work in progress. It's just the way things are, the way things have to be. When, and the reason why we comment on these beliefs in the first place, like you said, it's ridiculous. And most of our listeners are going to recognize that pretty early. But the reason we have to comment on it is because these are still the people that we uphold and we idolize in our society. And it's who we put our faith in. And even those who are skeptical, I think, of the Elon Musks of the world, still, we collectively have this uh, uh, tendency to throw up our hands and say, well, this is just the way the world is. I've had this conversation with so many people where, you know, before we started this podcast, and I was learning about so many of these ideas, I would tell people, and I'd get these like, apathetic shrugs where they basically say, well, you know, th this is the world we live in. People act this way and that's just how it is. And we have to challenge that idea because if we just accept the terms that are given to us, we'll never truly get that better world because we realize that these people don't fundamentally want to challenge anything about the status quo. And that's ultimately what a lot of philanthropy and charity is today is there are actions that do not fundamentally challenge anything about the current structure that is causing the problems that we're trying to solve through charity, but it eases the anxiety and the guilt that we feel at seeing a world creating so much destruction. So uh, we're almost done with Carnegie, but that brings us to kind of the topic of today, philanthropy, and what his ideas are on the subject. You know, he asks what is the proper way to dispense of this great wealth that men like him have accumulated? And he says he's really against the ability for people to inherit wealth. Um, he says the only other two ways to get rid of wealth is to bequeath it to the public or to uh, administer it during your life for some, some good. And he says, there remains then only one mode of using great fortunes. That is men using it during their lifetimes for good. Under this sway, we shall have an ideal state in which the surplus wealth of the few will become in the best sense the property of the many, because administered for the common good and this wealth passing through the hands of the few can be made a much more potent force for the elevation of our race than if it had been distributed in small sums to the people themselves. And so, David, this is his core belief that he as an individual can do more good with his wealth than the public can. And I just want to hone in on something he says here, David, which is that like the only alternative to, you know, using your wealth that you have acquired for like projects and, and making the world a better place. The only alternative to that in Carnegie's eyes is scattering it among the poor through the course of many years and trifling amounts. And there's a huge flaw in this. And it's something that comes up all the time today. Anytime someone discusses the merits of capitalism versus like socialism. It's this assumption that wealth distribution is only about scattering money around. And the idea of ownership never actually comes up. Carnegie is assuming that the only alternative to philanthropy is for wealthy men to pay their workers higher wages. He says, quote, consider what results from the Cooper Institute and compare these with those which would have arisen for the good of the masses from an equal sum distributed by Mr. Cooper in his lifetime in the form of wages, which is the highest form of distribution. Much of this sum, if distributed in small quantities among the people, would have been wasted in the indulgence of appetite, some of it in excess. So he's assuming that the only alternative to philanthropy is to pay people more. <laughs> it still assumes that all these people are still laboring under a wage system. And nothing about the underlying structure has changed. I think there's one more important assumption of his you need to point out there, Daniel. And that's not only that the option is either philanthropy or higher wages, but if you entrust people with higher wages, then these dumb workers are just going to waste that money on stupid things like beer and food and shit. Right. And couldn't possibly be using that for some other way that would be more responsible than the philosopher on high, that is Andrew Carnegie knows because he knows what's best because of his great wealth and experience and fuck all the people who made him all that money through his exploitation of them it's that that's their problem he's going to be the one to direct uh them with this very father-like daddy knows best way of, of approaching these problems which is the exact same thing we see today when people talk about like elon musk or donald trump Oh, of course he knows how to run things. He's a businessman, you know? He's going to drain the swamp. He's going to get rid of all this corruption because he can run a business. He's my daddy. Oh, of course Elon Musk is going to save us from all these uh, environmental problems. He's going to make an electric car that pollutes more than 
a a PHEV vehicle or whatever. You know, like all this dumb stuff. Like Elon Musk will save me because he's my daddy, and we have this giant daddy complex that I think really is is the real driver of our capitalist warship that we see today, and it's exemplified in this philanthropy. No, exactly. The, the uh, daddy knows best is a perfect way to uh, conceptualize this. And on that point, I want to read something he says a little bit further down in this essay. Quote, a well-known writer of philosophic books admitted the other day that he had given a quarter to a man who approached him. He knew nothing of the habits of this beggar, knew not the use that would be made of this money, although he had every reason to suspect that it would be spent improperly. The quarter given that night will probably work more injury than all the money which its thoughtless donor will ever be able to give in true charity will do good. And this was probably one of the most selfish and very worst actions of his life. <laughs> what, what does he think that quarter is going to do? Either he's, he's really, really down on how much good his wealth will do, or he thinks that quarter is just going to jack the river its way up through the slums or something. I mean, that is... That is uh, it's so selfish and evil. I mean, like, so I live in New York, right? And I'm I'm walking around. I'm in the subways a lot. Right. Day to day, there's probably five to 10 people that ask me for money just on a regular day. I mean, it happens all the time. It happens on the subway car. You walk into a restaurant. Someone's opening the door for you. And then they ask you for money. There's people in the streets. There's 80,000 homeless people in this city. And there's more people than that on the streets asking for money because they say they need that to get by. Whatever. Right. And when I have a dollar or a quarter in my pocket, I'm always going to give it away, even if I don't believe this person is going to use it for whatever good it is. I know there's some people who are like, I won't give you money, but I'll buy you food. Sometimes they say no. Uh, or those signs you'll see posted around, don't give money to panhandlers. Instead, donate to local charities who will help panhandlers. Um, but there's this assumption that these people either are trying to, to scam you or they're going to misuse this charity that you're giving them, right? Yeah. And it, it, it's in the very way that we approach people and the way that we perform this interaction between the beggar and the person who is being begged to. And because that's what we are, we're being begged to. And I always, if I have something, give it over because I don't care if they're going to go and turn around and spend that on alcohol or drugs or, or lotto tickets or whatever, because it is so hard to ask for money. It is so hard to be in the situation. You can look at this person. They need help. Regardless of, of whatever narrative uh, you might read in some tabloid that says these people make $150,000 a year or whatever begging, uh, who cares? Because every now and then somebody really genuinely does need that. And that quarter or that dollar can be a life or death difference. And even if it's not, you know, if this person is going to blow it on drugs, there's a reason that they're doing that. And if whatever, more power to you, man, spend it your way. I'm not going to tell you daddy knows best. It's your life. You control it. I don't need this dollar. Take it. And especially coming from somebody who like Andrew Carnegie, 25 cents is literally nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Well, in the end, he just assumes that those in need are stupid and worthless. And there is a big arrogance and contradiction actually in this narrative of, oh, you know, don't give a homeless person a dollar because they're just going to turn around and spend that on booze. Like, how many of us go home after a long day of work and say, oh, I need a, you know, I need a drink because my day was so hard. Yet we're going to deny that for a, you know, a homeless person because we think we know a better way for them to spend their money when here we are doing the exact same thing. You know, Andrew Carnegie was going home and pouring himself an expensive glass of whiskey, too. Uh, but because it's an expensive glass in a crystal decanter in a fancy ass living room, it's not the same. Even though he might get just as trashed, it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to spend too much more time on Carnegie, but there's two more quotes. 45 minutes later. Who cares? This will be a Carnegie show. But there are just like two more quotes I want to read, David, because it opens the door, I think, to understanding how hopeless it is to put our faith in billionaires of today. Uh, so first he says, those worthy of assistance, except in rare cases, seldom require assistance. The really valuable men of the race never do. He is the only true reformer who is as careful and as anxious not to aid the unworthy as he is to aid the worthy, and perhaps even more so, for in almsgiving more injury is probably done by rewarding vice than by relieving virtue. And then I want to read one more quote from him where he says, quote, We are met here with the difficulty of determining what are moderate sums to leave to members of the family. Again, he's against leaving huge sums of wealth to his family. 
Um, he goes on, what is modest, unostentatious living? What is the test of extravagance? The answer that it is impossible to name exact amounts of actions as it is to define good manners. But nevertheless, public sentiment is quick to know and to feel what offends these. The verdict rests with the best and most enlightened public sentiment. The community will surely judge and the judgments will not often be wrong. Okay, and and so what I really want to highlight about these two uh, ideas is just how wide open the door for interpretation they are, right? You know, he divides people up into drones and bees, the worthy, the unworthy, and he claims that working together for the benefit of common good is pointless and against the natural state of things. And then he also says that individual millionaires and billionaires are the best judge of how their money should benefit the public. But yet, when it comes to deciding whether or not millionaires are being inappropriate with their wealth, it becomes, oh, don't worry, uh, the public will decide if you're being inappropriate, and, and then that will determine the limits of your spending. Well, what public is he talking about? What community is he referring to? The millionaires and billionaires of his universe have acquired their wealth specifically because the needs, opinions, and the will of the working class, the, the so-called unworthy drones, these needs have been ignored. Who, who is left to hold these people accountable? And then, of course, because he's saying, you know, don't give your money to unworthy people, he leaves the door wide open for these billionaires to make up their own rules. You know, he's saying don't hoard your wealth. But in determining whether or not you're hoarding too much, he said, he's basically just saying, well, just ask your friends and, and see what they think. And, you know, there's also a contradiction in, in telling these people to use their wealth for good. But, oh, by the way, anybody who's too poor uh, to be successful is unworthy of any assistance, and I guess we should just let them die. Look, I think it's easy to read uh, an essay written by the world's richest man in the 1800s and like poke fun at it, you know? Like it's pretty obvious that many of the things he says are quite ridiculous. But we bring it up because, as ridiculous as his essay is, are his ideas really that different, you, you know, when we compare it to what we have today? You know, we have Bill Gates, for example, saying in a 2007 Harvard commencement speech, if we can find approaches that meet the needs of the poor in ways that generate profits for business and votes for politicians, we will have found a sustainable way to reduce inequity in the world. So, you know, Bill Gates is this very modern billionaire, tech savvy, but yet here he is upholding the law of wealth accumulation, right? saying that the only way to solve these problems is through profit Mm -hmm. and also political votes. And then, you know, here we have uh, another example I like comes from John Mackey, who is, I think he's still the CEO of Whole Foods, but he started this company, this grocery store, on the idea that, hey, capitalism has kind of gone awry. It's, you know, it's destroying the world, but it's not fundamentally capitalism's fault. It's just the fault of the individuals who are being bad. So his whole idea is that, well, if I can be good and change the way business operates, well, then I can save the world while still remaining in the status quo economics. And again, he's upholding the laws of competition and individualism that Carnegie held so tightly to when he says, quote, entrepreneurs are the true heroes in a free enterprise economy, driving progress in business, society, and the world. They solve problems by creatively envisioning different ways the world could and should be. With their imagination, creativity, passion, and energy, they are the greatest creators of widespread change in the world. And of course, the punchline of this conscious capitalism that John Mackey was espousing is that just a few years later, Amazon, one of the biggest and most destructive companies on the planet, acquired his grocery store because of all the valuable data on consumer shopping habits. And, and that's fundamentally the, the problem is that when you adhere to these laws of competition, you can't really escape them by remaining in the fundamental structures of our economy. That's that's true, Daniel. But you know what my favorite John Mackey story is? Just to get a better idea of what type of person would write all this stuff out. It wouldn't surprise me if he was like the the flip flop wearing type. Well, he uh, he got busted for trying to do some insider trading sort of stuff. He was posting um, and leaking information about his company on stock trading messaging boards, uh, disparaging other companies his company was trying to acquire. 
Eventually, the SEC found out and busted him for that. Um, I think the charges were ultimately dropped. But in a lot of those comments, he was talking about how cool John Mackey was, of course, pretending he was some anonymous person and how great John Mackey's hair was. So that's the type of person John Mackey is. I guess it's really not that hard to poke fun at the modern man of industry either. Actually, you know, David, my favorite quote from John Mackey is uh, when in 2010, he said that it would be a shame to let hysteria about global warming to cause us to raise taxes and increase regulation, which is interesting. The man who's going to save the world through this green revolutionary business practice thinks that climate change awareness is hysteria and how dare we use that to justify raising taxes. But back to philanthropy, David. Okay, so turning back to philanthropy, because that really is the topic of the show here. And and uh, we might have gotten distracted with endless amounts of conversation about Andrew Carnegie and now John Mackey, because, I mean, I guess at some root level, philanthropy is really a sort of celebrity idea of solving the world's problems. It's not about you or I going out and doing something, Daniel. It's our dependence on these people who, for whatever reason, have acquired huge amounts of power and wealth. And taking some of that wealth, and and it's never all, some of that wealth and turning it into what we see is supposed to be some sort of social good. And that's that's what modern philanthropy has done. And that's really the roots of it back when Andrew Carnegie was talking about it 130 years ago. So what is ostensibly the purpose then? If, If you ask some philanthropists what they're doing, they would say they're making the world a better place by doing good. And doing good is the core center idea of all of these philanthropic organizations of the people that we call philanthropists. But remember always that these individuals and these groups are the ones that are able to define good because they are not beholden to any other body or or source of checks or regulations, not the government, not the people. It is their sole power because they have so much wealth that they get to define good and then pursue that in whatever way they see fit. Yeah. And this is one of the great dangers, and and that is the word that I'm very carefully choosing to use, of philanthropy. Because a lot of times what a philanthropist, what a billionaire, what a hundred millionaire, whatever they are, defines as good is only good for them or is more good for them than it is for others. And they get to redefine our society, our culture, based on whatever their whims are at the time. And even our most celebrated philanthropists, people like Bill Gates, who give away billions of dollars a year, who have done so much ostensible good in the world. I mean, this is this is the point of the show where we say, oh, there go those ashes, ashes, boys, uh, telling us that even <laughs> the people doing good are actually doing bad. And I, I don't want to I don't want to do that because there is a lot of good that is being done. The work against malaria is obviously important in the, in the Gates Foundation example. There are downsides to that, and I don't know if we're going to get into them, um, but there's a lot of criticism in the programs that even though they are saving lives, they are turning attention away from other diseases. They are preventing, in some cases, from people even talking about diseases that aren't able to be vaccinated for. Um, You can find all sorts of criticism for this. You can also find a lot of criticism about Bill Gates in particular uh, out there. Uh, Citations Needed did a wonderful couple of episodes on just that. I highly recommend checking them out. We'll link them on the website. But yeah, and that's that's the podcast with Adam Johnson and Nima Shirazi. There's another podcast with a similar name. Yeah, no, you don't want citation needed. You want citations needed. But like I said, that that link will be on the website. But these people, in this example, Bill Gates gets to find what is good, and sometimes this backfires spectacularly because they oftentimes don't know what's best for all of us, even though they've convinced themselves they do because of their success in business and industry. You know, that that trope like, oh, I'm good with computers, so therefore I'm good at everything and I know how to solve the world's problems. It's a nice yeah. trap to fall into, but so oftentimes it is just that a trap. And Bill Gates, he spent billions and billions of dollars trying to redefine education in the United States and around the world. And, and there is no doubt in anybody's mind that the educational system as it exists in the United States is fundamentally broken. And this is something that, like I said, over and over again in the show, we will get to this. We're going to do a couple episodes on it, but it is such an enormous topic that we really need to finish all of our research and approach and figure out how best to to tackle this problem. We'll get to it eventually, I promise. But surprise, someone like Bill Gates, like you said, this individual who's unaccountable, who isn't subject to the democratic process that we normally uh, think that these 
massive transfers of wealth should be subject to. Big surprise, his solution to our broken public education system would be to turn it into a giant market where children are treated as inputs in this giant production line, you know, churning out educated young men and women. And this idea that you can kind of uh, use market principles to separate the good from the bad, separate the good teachers from the bad teachers, restrict funding for certain uh, schools, all so that you can, again, going back to that law of competition, pit schools against each other. Well, you know, what's really interesting about this charter school push that Bill Gates is currently doing, having spent billions of dollars on the program, both in actual programs as well as media and propaganda to push these ideas, in addition to lobbying of various types for local school organizations and at a national level. But this is only his latest revelation in a series of failed schooling attempts and experiments that he's been pursuing for decades at this point. So before it was charter schools, he decided the big problem was that high schools were too big and that if we could break up high schools into smaller schools, well, then all these educational problems would disappear. And so he did just that and found that it was a huge failure. It ended up costing more money and the results were basically exactly the same. And uh, there's 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 lots of problems here where they ignore what teachers are saying, what the problems are. Recently, spent over a billion dollars looking into this problem to say what is the big fundamental issues in education today. Teachers immediately said, well, first off, it's class size. Uh, the classes are too big. Uh, the kids don't have proper nutrition and uh, their lives outside of school are often stressful and problematic. And so the Bill Gates Foundation ignored all this and said, no, nah, you guys don't know what the problem is. We're going to spend a billion dollars gathering data, doing research to figure out what the problem is. And their final foundation results were, well, the problem is class sizes are too big. Kids need more nutrition and their lives outside of school are stressful and problematic, which are exactly the same thing that teachers have been saying for forever. But this sort of hubris that exists when philanthropists, especially modern philanthropic capitalists, approach a problem saying we need to collect data. We know better than the people who are actually in here experiencing these problems because we have a scientific business-minded aspect approach to solving problems means that we can really get to the final solutions that have been overlooked time and time again. And invariably, the solutions that they end up coming up with are the same ones people have been begging for for decades while billions of dollars were wasted trying to identify these problems that everybody already knew and understood. This is a situation that keeps repeating itself over and over again. It doesn't matter which philanthropist you're looking at or which programs they're doing. These same things keep reappearing. Richard Branson, who made billions of dollars on his transportation network on flying airplanes around the world, has now pledged that he's taking the profits from his transportation network and putting them into green energy research because climate change is such a problem. Ignoring the fact, of course, that his transportation network is contributing hugely to that climate change problem in the first place. He's trying to band-aid this global catastrophe by funding it with a program that is fueling that catastrophe in the first place. And so much of philanthropists and modern-day philanthropic capitalist ideas are, how do we band-aid these problems that we, in part, have created in the first place? No, that, that is a great point, David. But I want to expand on something you said, which is that these problems happen over and over again. And I think it's kind of a symptom of this individualized way of looking at things where we're already looking at individual billionaires to try and solve problems. Um, so when they fail, it, again, going back to the John Mackey example, it's kind of like it wasn't the system that they were a part of that failed. It's the fact that they just made a mistake or we need someone better in there. We need better ideas. Another quick example is after the 2010 earthquake that shattered Haiti, the Red Cross collected like over $500 million in donations. That's half a billion dollars. And it basically just vanished. You know, after, after all that collecting, they built a grand total of six homes in their project area. And so there's this big discussion about that in the nonprofit world of like, what went wrong? What were the inefficiencies? What were the incompetencies? And it becomes this story of how an individual or an individual organization made a mistake. But we really need to step back and say, well, what is the overall, the larger system in which all these individual players function? And I think we need a framework for understanding that. Otherwise, we're just going to keep replacing uh, these, uh, these people with more and more people that ends up just making the same mistakes over and over again. And, and that's because I think the framework is that these people aren't necessarily making mistakes, but they play an important role in managing the excesses, if you will, of our political and economic system. And so there's this idea that as wealth is accumulated through our economic systems, 
It does so through extraction. We've talked about this. Environmental destruction is the price we pay for profit accumulation. And so as this occurs around the world, you have resentment that builds up. You have people's lives that are shattered, habitats that are destroyed. And if this just goes unchecked, people wouldn't stand for it. So every now and then, these philanthropists kind of step in to serve this uh, function of making people feel like everything's okay. Making people feel that we're working on solutions, that these problems aren't a result of the system, but they're merely vestiges of our old ways and that this new path that we're charting is going to cover up these problems and make a better world. So we had the free market movement beginning in the 70s and 80s that kind of kicked off a total transformation of the global economy. We've kind of touched on this like in our episode 28, Dead End. And this process reoriented national economies, particularly in the global south, from ones of economic self-sufficiency to ones that were export-led so that their national resources could be turned into commodities for a global financial market. And that has led to increased fragility in the global financial system. We see way more economic shocks that cascade from country to country. And so as Matthew Bishop and Michael Green write in their book, Philanthrocapitalism, which is a defense of this kind of philanthrocapitalism that we're talking about, David, and how it can ultimately save the world, they say that, quote, since the birth of modern capitalism in Europe, rich business people have consistently played a leading role in solving the big social problems of their day. Indeed, it seems to be a feature of capitalism that golden ages of wealth creation give rise to golden ages of giving, end quote. And so now, again, they're writing in defense and praise of these generous billionaires who follow up their extreme concentration of wealth and power and start giving back to the people. But as many have pointed out, we should be skeptical of this process. And so here's Nicole Askoff again, writing in The New Prophets of Capital. Quote, Philanthropy booms, triggered by rapid increases in inequality during periods of massive wealth expansion, serve as a kind of release valve for capitalism by ameliorating some of its worst excesses. The tycoons of the early 20th century sought to dole out their benevolence in a systematic manner. They also hoped to extract influence over social programs and public opinion, which was intensely anti-capitalist at the time. They also worked behind the scenes to shape movements and policy. So that's kind of the overall framework. We might consider the actions and motives of the modern philanthrocapitalists. That it's not that it's necessarily just giving back to the community, but there's an ideological purpose behind the things they choose to divert their money to. And I think we can look to a few examples, David, that really highlight this in the realm of foreign relations and domestic affairs here in the United States. Uh, But first, maybe we should start just broadly examining this idea that maybe all this philanthropy isn't for the right reasons or sometimes actively something that's bad or negative. But even going back from that, just at a very conceptual level, there's some basic things we should understand, and especially around this sort of pressure release valve, that the idea that philanthropy is there to make us essentially not chop the heads off of these extremely wealthy industrialists which was something that Andrew Carnegie and others were obviously very concerned about with the memories of the French Revolution fairly recent in their minds. So let's look at an example just very conceptually and, and understand first off that somebody who has this much wealth is somebody who has exploited people in order to get it because you cannot generate this much money without at some point taking it from somewhere else. And that is either from somebody's labor or through the exploitation of natural resources and the sullying of that product for the rest of us. It's innate in this product. This is so much money. And and we hear $30 million, we hear $100 million, we hear a billion dollars, we hear $100 billion. And these are just numbers. They're almost meaningless. But to understand just how much fucking money this really is and how incredibly, unbelievably wealthy these people are, uh, very quickly. If you have $3 million, okay, which is not even considered high net worth, it's a lot of money, but that's not high net worth. Okay. $3 million invested in a fairly conservative fund, you can pull out 3% of that for forever without ever hurting your total amount invested. So you'll have $3 million for forever. Every year you can pull out 3% and that $3 million will actually slowly grow 
in most market conditions. So you can pass it on to your children or whatever, or set up a foundation and it'll exist for forever. And that 3% that you're pulling out is $100,000 annually. It's not a ton of money, but that is more than enough money to live comfortably in most places in the world outside of a couple extremely rich cities. And even in then, in New York, San Francisco, Moscow, London, that's still enough money to live comfortably, just not extravagantly. Okay, let's multiply that by a little bit. Now you have $10 million, right? This still sounds like basically nothing compared to what Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos has. But $10 million in the same sort of principle nets you $300,000 a year. That's enough to live very well anywhere in the world. Yeah, granted, you're not going to be living in a penthouse that costs $30 million and is on Central Park or something like that. You might only have a couple of houses, but you can live extremely well anywhere in the world without much money. And you can do this forever without working a day in your life. That's $10 million. So let's jump up to what is considered for the first time ultra high net worth. Okay. This is $30 million. There's 250,000, give or take, people in the entire planet who have this much money or more. That's actually not uh, as many as I might think. Yeah. So that really helps understanding how few people there are who are this wealthy in the first place. But $30 million, if you invested it in the same way, you're pulling out 3% a year, you're making a million dollars a year at this point, more or less. And you can live on that for forever without ever working, without ever losing any of your total investment, give or take market willing. Right. Who needs more money than that? A million dollars a year. That's a huge amount of money. You can live extremely extravagantly on that. And over the course of your life, of course, that money adds up. If you reinvest it all in yourself, if you live a pauper's life, that $30 million can be 60 million, can be 100 million. And very quickly, you can see how being wealthy enables you to become fabulously more wealthy extremely quickly. And this is the area where we're starting to get into philanthropist territory. When you have $30 million and up, you are wealthy enough that you can start being considered to be a powerful philanthropist. But somebody like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, a man who has over $100 billion worth of wealth, that $10 million figure that he could live for $300,000 a year for the rest of his life, he could do that not just once, not 10 times, that's $100 million, not 100 times, that's $1 billion. Now let's skip all the way up to 10,000 times that he has $10 million, that's $100 billion, and Jeff Bezos is even richer than this amount. He could spend that $10 million 9,999 times and still have $10 million left over. Are, are we getting, and, and remember, each one of those $10 million can generate somebody's lifetime salary of $300,000 a year for forever. So, I mean, this is a huge, huge, huge amount of money these people control, and we forget that. We forget how much money that is because they're just numbers at some point. They start becoming meaningless. But the difference between a million and a billion is unfathomable. This is enormous, enormous amounts of money. And the fact that we just wave our hand and say, okay, yeah, you know, that's how much money that you have if you're successful is first off just ludicrous. But second off, the fact that a man like Jeff Bezos, who's worth over $100 billion until he, I guess, his divorce, um, spends basically pocket change, like literally the equivalent of a couple of dollars of his money on charity should be enough that we're scrambling to take his money away any way possible because he just shouldn't have that much. And of course, that money came from the Amazon warehouse workers who are pissing in bottles and sleeping in their vans outside their warehouse because they can't live on anything else because he abuses them and pays them so little, but they have no choice because it's the economy that we've constructed. So look at this inequality this man has created and many others like him who have this much wealth. These are the 250,000 wealthiest people in the world. In the United States, there's 70 or 80,000 of them, depending on what number you're looking at, and they control well over half the wealth in this country. In fact, the top 40 of these people in the United States control the same amount of wealth as the bottom 150 million people in the United States. Well, hold on, David. I th- you kind of just glossed over it, but I think that was a really important point where you said Jeff Bezos actually creates inequality, right? And, and that's how, in large part, that wealth is created. This is something we discussed uh, more in depth in episode welfare titans, where Jeff Bezos was able to create this Amazon hegemony in large part by pitting cities against each other, right, for these tax subsidies. So already he's encouraging cities to raise taxes on their own people, uh, raise property taxes, slash funding for public services so that they can transfer that money to him so that he can open warehouses. And then when he does open those warehouses, especially in impoverished areas where his company becomes the only employer in town, 
He now slashes the union benefits that people were used to. He pays them way less than they're used to. And now they have no choice but, like you said, to piss in bottles and sleep in their cars for some people or work these grueling 10-hour days where they hope they can make it to the two-year mark to start qualifying for benefits. In reality, though, since they're pitted against each other as, as competitive cogs in this great machine, most of them don't even make it to the two-year mark to get those benefits. And so that is the inequality that he creates, and that's where he acquires his billions. And then the idea that he just throws some change out to say, hey, I funded this social program that sets up you know, food banks or whatever. I don't even think he's actually an active philanthropist, David. So no, not really. He he's investing his billions in space travel because he thinks that's necessary for some reason. But uh, it, it, so yeah, I, I think you're, you're. It's a great point. He's exploiting his workers. He's exploiting taxpayers in these municipalities. He's also a war profiteer. We have to remember Amazon is an enormous defense contractor with contracts for the Department of Defense as well as the various intelligence agencies of the United States who are actively invading all our privacy, many times illegally. This is a man that has no scruples, but passes himself off as a bookseller. And we're supposed to look the other way because he donates a small amount of this money to charity, or because at some point he will make a pledge that I'm going to donate $50 billion to charity. Everything I did to get these ill-gotten goods is fine. And uh, bringing back to that point that Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, others like him create this inequality, they never actually take their philanthropy to fight things like inequality. It's always targeted on things like poverty, which is a symptom of this larger inequality that they've created. And a lot of times a philanthropist will be saying, yeah, we're attacking these systemic problems and we're trying to fight poverty in ways of we're, we're, we're creating education, we're after school lunch programs. And these are good programs. These are good things to have. Again, we don't want to be saying that education or nutrition or smaller class sizes aren't great ideas because they are. But these are problems in the first place because these schools are underfunded, because of the inequality that exists in these communities. And passing out bags of food isn't going to solve that because the inequalities in these communities are created by the exploitation of the people who live in these communities, exploitation that is carried out by billionaire philanthropists like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and the rest of these like. This is a group of people who are going around trying to apply bandages into the problems that they've created in the first place. And in many cases, some of these philanthropic efforts they're doing are not only trying to bandage the problems that they've created, but in many cases are creating entirely new problems or pushing solutions that are designed to further entrench themselves as the top of the status quo. When John D. Rockefeller initially tried to set up his foundation, it was rejected by the Congress and the president at the time, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, this kind of badass figure in, in American history and is kind of upheld as this man who was tough on monopolies, but still pretty pro-business. He said at the time, quote, no amount of charity and spending such fortunes can compensate in any way for the misconduct in acquiring them. But David, I want to, again, step a little bit back and move away for a second from these individuals. And I want to look at the role that these ostensibly philanthropic organizations play in foreign relations, like informing policy that our governments enforce around the world, and also domestic social issues like race and civil rights. So, for example, we have the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a, a nonprofit think tank based in New York City and Washington, D.C. It specializes in policy recommendations and research to guide international relations between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Well, it was founded in 1921 with money from the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations. And here's from their website, quote, The Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, is an independent, nonpartisan membership organization, think tank, and publisher dedicated to being a resource for its members government officials, business executives, journalists, educators and students, civic and religious leaders, and other interested citizens in order to help them better understand the world and the foreign policy choices facing the United States and other countries. Now, David, you notice the words independent and nonpartisan. Yet when I looked up its funding sources for its main think tank, which, <laughs> which appropriately enough is named the David Rockefeller Studies Program, 44% of the think tank's funding comes from foundations, 29%, corporations, 7%, and other grants at 18%. And all of this funding is, is qualified as restricted sources, which means, quote, funds must be used to support a particular purpose or project. 
And so there's another thing that stands out to me about this nonprofit, which is, again, just one nonprofit in a sea of organizations that make up a particular foundation-funded network. And that's another concept to think about in this framework is that these philanthropic foundations, it's not just Bill Gates going out to Africa and like, you know, personally sponsoring these projects. It's the idea is to create a network. Like we have an idea, we have a purpose, and we're going to fund grants. We're going to fund nonprofits, NGOs. We're going to fund partnerships with universities and politicians and corporations to create this kind of bedrock for a new way of thinking, right? So think about how many people are potentially supported and dependent on the work provided through these networks and are therefore subject to the subtle ideological frameworks created through these networks. As the CFR mentioned, these are business executives, journalists, educators, and students, religious leaders. We might also imagine artists, community activists, volunteers, and more who may all in some way be dependent on the work provided through, in this case, just one organization. And I want to be clear here, David, the, the point of this is not that I'm saying outright that one way or another that this particular nonprofit or even the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations are inherently evil or bad or cause bad outcomes to occur in the world. The point is that the wealth and power that is concentrated in these foundations wield tremendous, unaccountable, and undemocratic influence over the policies that our governments and corporations support, which then shape the curriculums that are taught in school the narratives portrayed in media, and ultimately the norms and narratives about how our society is and should be structured. This goes so much beyond simple, like a charity donation to a, a soup kitchen. This is like uh, world building, right? At the government level, at the, at the society level of the way we think and operate and the policies that we enact. That's what philanthropy is when you get to the billionaire level. Exactly. It, it Something as small as even directing money towards a cause without actually getting any sort of results or any programs in place just saying we're going to invest in this type of idea can be enough to divert the attention of entire nations and the way that they spend their, their welfare money or aid money, uh, as well as other organizations. And it can leave entire very important causes ignored and left to the side because the Gates Foundation the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, whatever, decided that this problem is more important or this problem is not important at all. And this ability to change the narrative is, is another sort of hidden power of these philanthropic efforts that is given almost zero thought or, or consideration. But let's provide some hard examples of different ways that this influence can play out in some places extremely subtly. A great example of how Foundations serve as proxies for government while being totally decoupled from democratic input comes from the Ford Foundation's role in helping shape the post-World War II war on poverty. In particular, the Ford Foundation was eager to develop industry within cities, and it helped the U.S. government enact legislation for the creation of what are known as Community Development Corporations, or CDCs, and also community-based organizations known as CBOs. And both of these were and are neighborhood-level organizations that advocate for tenant rights, small businesses, affordable housing, and other related issues. And the funding for these organizations has historically come from foundations primarily, but also corporations. And in 2002, the Ford Foundation donated $1 million to just three inner-city advocacy groups alone. And these these organizations all came about at a time when the Ford Foundation and others were really interested in urban development in the United States. And it begs the question, why was the foundation creating social advocacy groups that were fighting in part against urban development that was displacing people from their homes so that office buildings could be built? Why would the foundation support these groups at the same time they were promoting this urban development? And as G. William Domhoff, a sociology professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, writes, these foundations and charitable efforts were attempting to absorb the resentment that people experienced as they were displaced from their homes from this development. Quote, when riots and the destruction of property broke out in the 60s, the Ford Foundation and the government decided they had to allow more participation in the programs by black activists. There is very good evidence that the groups and agencies supported by the foundations cooled out the worst tensions, channeling anger into what moderates saw as more constructive forms of protest. 
The Ford Foundation did not create the network of corporate donations to community service groups simply by hiring experts and bringing them together with corporate executives. Instead, it was reacting to activists who were trying to stop urban renewal or to white neighborhoods that were agitated by the influx of African Americans. That is, the network was created by an unusual and in many ways uneasy alliance of foundation officials and community activists. Ostensibly, it was in the business of trying to reduce the tension of black-white residential integration, but it was in fact trying to manage downtown expansion and white-to-black neighborhood transitions with as little disruption and violence as possible. End quote. I think that's such a great example of this pressure release valve uh, framework of understanding philanthropic giving, where uh, we're trying to transform the economy to allow for greater extraction, but oh, look, that's causing people to be angry. So what is the least we can do in terms of cost um, to placate them? And that's essentially what this was. This was a grand campaign of placating black activists who were angry at being displaced from their homes, who, by the way, didn't have anywhere to go because of racial exclusion, barring them from some of the uh, real estate projects that were open to white people at the time. Similarly, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations funded the creation of the National Urban Coalition shortly after the inner city race riots of 1967. Now, this was a short lived civil rights advocacy nonprofit that advocated for job training, education, housing programs, and other opportunities for blacks in America. It's a good thing, but ultimately rested on the premise that partnerships were needed between industry and the government to develop the inner city. Here's Joan Roloff's writing in Critical Sociology quote. As the civil rights movement became more militant, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations responded by creating the National Urban Coalition to transform black power into black capitalism, the latter usually denoting minority franchise ownerships. The NUC was a significant departure in philanthropy, enlisting corporate foundations and funding grassroots and civil rights organizations in addition to their previous community benevolence or university and think tank support, end quote. And I've seen this play out even still to today when you have people in radical black activist communities, things like Black Lives Matter, or casual people who are adjacent to these and are just learning about it, who are getting woke for the first time. And they ask, you know, what can I do to make a difference? And for some reason, especially in the black community, the answer that comes up a lot is invest in black businesses, put your money in black owned banks. And this idea is one of the very powerful ways that people are able to direct their restlessness, their energy of being angry at the shit deal that they're getting in their lives and put it towards something that is designed by groups like the Ford Foundation, like the Rockefeller Foundation, to take this violent militant energy and make it something that can be profited off of and not disrupt the status quo. Yeah, you're still being exploited by banks, you're still being exploited by these small businesses, but this time they're owned by black capitalists. And that's okay in this larger system because we're still protecting the system that enables us to uh, apply all this philanthropy to where it needs to be done and to also protect the systems that allowed us to accumulate this wealth in the first place. That's really interesting about uh, activist capture that you're talking about, David. I want to come back to that, but but coming back to the way that foundations play a role in policy, I want to talk about a couple foreign relations examples. First one coming from Latin America. And that was that in the 1970s, the CIA was involved in a military coup of Chile's democratically elected president, after which a military dictator was installed, Pinochet. Many people know about this. And through this dictator, death squads kidnapped, tortured, and killed countless teachers, journalists, students, and more. Also, that free market policies of austerity, privatization, and export led investment could be imposed on the unwilling population. And I think this was also part of that broader uh, economic transformation that I mentioned earlier that was happening in the 70s and 80s, where the economic powers centered in the West were really cracking down on any government, any poor country around the world that wouldn't sign up to these new economic paradigms of export-led development and all this. And so I think that's why you saw this push to overthrow all these governments in the United States backyard. But anyway, before this coup occurred, the Ford Foundation played an important role in partnership with the Chicago School of Economics in training the people from Latin America who would eventually implement those policies. 
But the Ford Foundation and the, the company it represented had a more direct role in Latin American affairs than just that. Three years after that Chilean coup in 1976, Argentina's president was similarly overthrown by a violent military junta. And the Ford Motor Company was quick to promote support, even taking out an ad in the paper celebrating Argentina's new leadership, which is not surprising since the new economic policies being implemented were straight out of the economic school that the Ford Foundation had helped start, and which were staunchly anti-worker, pro-corporate ownership. Um, And this was important to Ford Motor Company since it owned factories in Argentina at the time. Uh, And in fact, the company even supplied vehicles to the new military junta and this dictatorship. And in in return, the military showed up to Ford's factories and violently attacked any pro-union workers. In one case, the junta kidnapped pro-union workers off the factory floor and then located them to a detention facility right there within Ford's own factory and tortured them for weeks. And I mean, these stories, as insane as they sound, shouldn't be anything new to the listeners of this show. Because we've talked about it before. In episode 28, Debt End, one of our favorites, we discussed the ways that international finance communities co-opted South Africa's fight against racial apartheid. And the Rockefeller Foundation played an important role in this co-opting. When Nelson Mandela came to power after being in prison for decades, he headed the African National Congress in pursuit of achieving the goals of the Freedom Charter and ultimately an end to apartheid. But Western powers had big problems with the ANC. And that was the marriage of certain economic ideals with anti-apartheid goals, namely that the ANC wanted to return stolen land back to the people and maintain public ownership over national resources. And that's the big one. So the goal from the standpoint of the West became how do we maintain our economic structures in the region while also satiating the South Africans with racial equality, at least on paper? To help do that, who do we turn to? Well, the Rockefeller Foundation created a commission in 1978 to travel to the country and recommend policies to the U.S. government that would, quote, best respond to the problems posed by South Africa and its dismaying systems of racial separation and discrimination, end quote. Sounds good, right? Well, ultimately, the ensuing report recommended policies for the U.S. government that would ensure equal political participation along racial lines in South Africa, but at all costs, the U.S. should preserve access to South African oil preserve U.S. private investments, and prevent South Africa from closing off access to their mineral reserves. And so what we ended up with, as we discussed in that episode, was a country that ended racial apartheid on paper, while economic apartheid became arguably much worse. And the core goals of the Freedom Charter never materialized. Yet foundations like Rockefeller get to look like philanthropic heroes for contributing to, quote, black welfare by preserving an economic system that ensured continued profits at the expanse of sovereignty and self-sufficiency for black South Africans. But we don't have to look to the past for these sorts of ideas. These happened even recently. So back when Obama was trying to pass universal health care, there was a push that this bill could only be passed if it was balanced and would not cost us anything more. So we had to look at the budget and figure out what could we cut in order to try and pay for this, what is going to be, at least for the government, a much more expensive system, even if that means all us citizens are going to be paying less because we don't have to cover insurance, whatever. But, but how does the government do this without making a big tax bill? That was the question. And one of the suggestions they had was, well, let's cut down on charitable deductions. And make sure that not 100% of your deduction comes off your taxes, but a smaller percentage of that. And who fought this hardest of all, Daniel? You want to hazard a guess? Um, Pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies. um... Well, they were fighting the bill, obviously, very, very intensely. But this particular thing really pissed off the philanthropic community because they are dependent, at least they thought, on these charitable donations. If people aren't getting as much of a tax write-off, they're not going to make as much money, and then ostensibly, they're not going to be able to do as much good. But here's the thing. A lot of these organizations are doing programs that are supposed to take care of the symptoms of people having no access to healthcare right. or spending a lot of their money on healthcare. And if we had a universal healthcare system, then this is going to greatly reduce poverty. This is going to reduce inequality. This is going to make people not sick, which is hugely important. Uh, It's going to take care of that bankruptcy problem that we see because the majority of American bankruptcies are medically related. It's going to make sure people have better nutrition. Overall, you're going to have a healthier, happier, smarter, more educated, less unequal population if you can pass universal health care. But because their bottom line was threatened, huge amounts of these philanthropic foundations, including some very large ones, started lobbying against universal health care, fighting this bill 
that is going to do a lot of the work that they claim that they want to do. But as soon as their status quo was threatened, they decided it's more important to protect this system that feeds our trough than it is to make real, actionable, humongous change in the lives of the Americans and the people that they're supposed to be assisting. And so they helped to kill that bill and turn it into the abomination that is the Affordable Care Act that we see today. And whatever that's going to ha- turn into and, and happen to that is a whole other conversation that we've talked about at length, actually. But this is the kind of double-sided, two-faced world that is the philanthropic industry. But, you know, the problem with this doesn't end there. And if we're on the topic of taxes uh, uh, and the way that we control these charitable donations, philanthropy, as, as at least in the eyes of the IRS, is all seen as equal. Right, Daniel? So if I donate a million dollars to an opera, that is seen as the same amount as good as donating a million dollars to the people of Flint so they can have water, to a natural disaster response, to a program that makes sure that people don't starve to death. There is no difference, philanthropically speaking. <laughs> I was going to say, David, I, I feel like I know where you're going with this, but on the one hand, it's like kind of hard. Maybe it's, it would be difficult to expect our tax you know, institution to ascribe social value to a certain oh, yeah. giving. But no. here's but here's a simple solution that I just came up with, David, which is anything you donate money to that's gonna have your name on it should be an immediate uh cancellation of your tax <laughs> benefit. Yeah, I mean right? that would be one simple solution, but there's so many loopholes that people work their way around and figure out. I, I, I'm not saying that the government needs to be this watchdog that exists to prescribe like the ethical considerations of, oh, this is worth saving X lives. And this is only saving, you know, how how do we rank the art or culture against the human life? You you can't do that. And I'm not saying the government should, but we really don't see a difference in this. And that means we have a lot of philanthropic donations of charity that's going out there that is paying for things that is ultimately self-serving or status quo intensifying. And education is one of the largest areas that receives philanthropic grants. But most of this money that's going to fuel this this huge amount of, of donations and charity that's entering the education system is going to private schools and expensive public institutions and universities. This is a further intensifying effect on the inequality that we're seeing. People aren't funding these poor schools, these schools that don't have enough money because their alumni aren't making huge amounts of money because they're being held down by this inequality that that's exists because their education was worse because the system that they're in is worse. So that school gets worse. Meanwhile, the schools that are able to generate very successful, wealthy, well-connected alumni are able to take in more money from those alumni. And that allows them to intensify this process. And so the very philanthropic grant giving that exists in order to fuel this education ends up intensifying the inequality That then generates more philanthropy and makes the problem even worse. So a huge amount of philanthropy is actually going to systems that make inequality worse, believe it or not. Mm. And and this is all ultimately because of the tax benefits that we receive from making these charitable donations. And if we didn't have this this impetus to give and and receive a very instant gratification on it beyond the, the various types of charity and charitable giving reasons that we have as individuals, yeah, the bottom line would be impacted a lot, but maybe we would see a huge shift in how money is being spent and what people considered important and passionate to them. And these high powered schools would see a lot less money coming into them. And we would see money turned instead towards where can I make the most difference? Where can I do the most good? And I'm not saying that we need to get rid of the charitable foundations. I'm sure there's a math equation. Some economists are working out constantly justifying in whatever think tank they're in that their foundation's funding is perfect. But there is definitely. And, and, and has historically been a question of, is a tax deduction for charity and philanthropic donations a good idea? And for most of our history, we said no, for very obvious reasons. People like Teddy Roosevelt were very against this idea. But now, increasingly, we just accept philanthropy as, of course, it's good. Of course, there can't be anything bad. There's problematic parts of it, but overall, it's a net good. And so we shouldn't question it. We shouldn't say, well, we should change the system around because it is doing good and we don't want to affect that. But we'd never talk about what good is it doing? Could we be doing more good or are we actively harming things and intensifying the status quo that create these problems in the first place? And that, if you only get one thing out of this episode and you've forgotten all the Carnegie stuff we talked about, just take away that point. It's okay to question philanthropy. It's okay to say, yeah, you're doing good, but I don't trust entirely why you're doing it and what good you've decided to do. Although with the caveat being that there are a lot of criticisms of charity, David, though, 
that are used to justify taking away support from people. You know, kind of going back to the Carnegie idea of, oh, it's so selfish to give a man a quarter because you've injured him and and now he can't go make that quarter for himself and now he's just going to turn lazy. There's a lot of people that conflate this idea that philanthropy is bad because it serves an ideological function and it reshapes our world in an undemocratic way. That sometimes gets conflated with the idea of we shouldn't assist people, they should assist themselves, and therefore we can feel justified pulling the rug out beneath public funding for school education or public funding for programs that genuinely provide support for people, right? And you mentioned charitable giving, and and that's a whole other flip side to this discussion is we as individuals who take part in this process. Like I mentioned earlier, the $500 million that Red Cross got, well, that came from I mean, yes, foundations and corporations, but also from you and me, people who saw that happen and said, well, what can I do to help? And that was our best option that we could perceive. And so we sent money that way. And, you know, we started recording for this episode yesterday, actually, David, and we were about an hour in and we decided it wasn't going the way we planned. It wasn't working. We we didn't have a focus. Um, We need to go back to the drawing board and reconvene today. And I think the reason that happens is because we were trying to cover too much, right? These foundations and philanthropists that had them really function through this creation of networks, nonprofits, university relationships, like I alluded to earlier. And we were trying to address too many things within those networks, including these individual small nonprofits and our own charitable giving as individuals. And it was just becoming confusing and long-winded. And so we took this step back and decided, let's just focus on the foundations and philanthropists themselves, because we can always come back to this topic and expand on how these smaller organizations play a role in all this and how we as individuals might be contributing to the perpetuation of some of these paradoxes. But there's another difficulty, David, and, th- and that's that you just can't come out and say that nonprofits and NGOs and these social change organizations function within some larger evil system. You can't, you can't just say that initially because the truth is that so many nonprofits and other organizations that are supported by these corporate um, and philanthropic foundations, they do a lot of good in the world. And we can't sit here and say that because the Ford Foundation sponsored the creation of these local neighborhood organizations in service of promoting civil rights in America, we can't say that the work being done on the ground was wrong. We can't say that those activists, like you mentioned, that end up getting captured by this nonprofit industrial system are doing bad things, right? And just because the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation wants to revolutionize farming in India and Africa by commercializing and patenting seeds and destroying the base of small-scale farmers that ultimately make food production sustainable and provide a way forward in the face of climate change, like we talked about in episode 52, Killing Fields, our episode on pesticides, That doesn't mean that a local African using money supplied by a nonprofit, funded by a regional organization, which is funded through grant money, administered by the Gates Foundation. We can't say that this local using that money to connect farmers in her community with suppliers and with communication resources and with other valuable things, that that connection invalidates her work. It it doesn't. Because the bottom line is that work that she's doing may be something that needs to get done regardless of where the funding comes from. And here's the point I'm trying to make. If the funding to do this work is coming from a position of unaccountable and undemocratic sources that are headed by individuals of unprecedented wealth and power, secured more often than not through exploitative means, then there is reason to question the motives. Like you said, it's, it's good to question the philanthropy. Because again, the work itself may be important, but it's also likely that it's being co-opted to serve a nefarious purpose or some underlying ideological framework that we didn't agree to. Yes, it, it may be important to deliver vaccines to children, but should we then allow vaccines to be delivered to children on the condition that those vaccines are patented and monopolized in the process for profitable gain? And that's exactly the point. The work of these nonprofits do good, but that's exactly why foundations want a part of it, because they can take something that is good 
and integrate it with an ideology that supports their Carnegie-inspired core beliefs of wealth accumulation and competition. It's why companies like Lockheed Martin have supported the NAACP and the Urban League. It's why Ford and Rockefeller were integral in the early formation of the NAACP. It's why the Rockefeller Foundation helped steer South Africa's uh, ANC away from its Freedom Charter, co-opting the cause of human and civil rights to legitimize economic exploitation. It's why these foundations have been so keen to fund American civil rights organizations at the grassroots level, because true movements of solidarity between oppressed people represent one of the greatest threats to capital accumulation on this earth. But if you can segment and divide those mass movements into fragmented organizations, each dependent on external funding and under the influence of corporate and foundation-approved leadership, you can ensure that those protests and movements remain non-threatening to the status quo while preserving an image of being some patriotic and benevolent giver. Look, I know we feel powerless in the scale of the amount of money that is being tossed around in this world. What are you and I supposed to do, Daniel, against somebody who has $100 billion, who has a foundation who spends $3 billion a year, and especially when a lot of this money is really and truly honestly going to good causes, even if it could maybe be a better way of doing it, or it's slightly exploitative and what it's pushing. That aside, I mean, good is being done. And who are we to say that we should question this system? But I think we need to, and we really need to remember that that is the very first thing that we can do here. We can call into question that maybe not everything that Bill and Melissa Gates do with their foundation is immediately only good. We should look at it and say, well, why are they doing this? How are they benefiting from pushing this charter school narrative? Is it really a great idea to turn to industrialized agriculture in places like Africa? It's okay to call this in question because even though you're not spending all this money, you can say, well, why are they spending this money? That's an important concept that we should all be doing with everything that we encounter all the time. A second point is we should be considering that should we really be giving all this tax deductible credit to our charitable givings? Yes, this seems like a radical idea at first, but time and time again, it has shown that much of this money is being directed to places where it's not really benefiting people. There's a lot of bad charities. There's a lot of foundations that are essentially tax shelters. And all of this is taking advantage of the fact that we can give money to a cause that probably isn't that good and get tax credit for us. And, and oftentimes profit off of that process because our friends, our family are working in these foundations, making huge amounts of money and getting credit on their CV that ultimately allows them to jump into the private industry in a way that allows them to exploit all the rest of us that much better. So it's OK to question the fact that maybe charitable donations should not be huge tax credits and should be reduced in order to get rid of some of this uh, secondary personal profiting incentive of the process. And third, we really need to remember who these people are. These philanthropists, by and large, are extremely wealthy white men, old white men. And they are so far removed from the rest of us by their billions of dollars, by their lofted apartments, by their walled off beach homes, that they don't understand the problems that we're going through. They spend billions of dollars trying to understand these problems and trying to get to the solutions that you and I already know. We saw this in earlier in this episode with Bill Gates trying to investigate what's the problem with these classrooms when teachers have known for decades what the problem is. Billions of dollars later, they came to the same conclusions that all of us already knew. And it's not just the billionaires themselves who are doing this, but the people running these foundations, pulling in these six-figure salaries, they are just as out of touch as the people writing the checks. So it's okay to remember that these people don't know what's best for you. Because you know what's best for you, because you are in these communities, you are living these problems. And therefore, because you understand that, you are an expert. There is no think tank filled with experts trying to understand poverty better than the people who are actually living in poverty. The people who really know what it would take for them personally to pull themselves out of that. You have the answers and solutions in these communities. You can put these into practice a lot of times by yourself without that giant philanthropist check. And even if you aren't, if somebody comes in and says, what can we do? You have the answer for that. It's okay to reach out and say, I know, I have an idea. Let's try this. And that's something that philanthropists are trying to take away from each and every one of us. That individual ability to say, I know how to have change. I know how to make the world a better place. Because they want to be our daddy writing the check saying, no. I know what's best for you. But we can push back against that and say, no, I know what's best for me. And if you would listen to that, then maybe we could actually do something and make the world a better place. 
I couldn't say it any better than that, David. So I just want to leave you uh, with one short story. Uh, one short story. <laughs> Uh, there was a there was a man, a, a titan of industry named John Emery Andrus. He lived between 1841 and 1934. He became wealthy through a chemical manufacturing company, uh, as well as several real estate and other investments that he made during his life. And when he died, he left 45% of his estate to the creation of the Serdna Foundation, which today manages $1 billion. And side note, David, I think it's always interesting when people describe these billionaires as philanthropic, when the size of their foundations only get bigger over time. Like clearly they're not gifting their money away when it somehow makes a profitable return. But anyway, today, some of Mr. Andrus's descendants are unhappy with the way the current foundation spends money on uh, social justice projects when according to them, their great, great ancestor was an unabashed capitalist. So according to two cousins that object to the foundation's new leadership, the foundation recently gave to the Neighborhood Funders Group, uh, which is an organization that supports place-based community-led efforts that target the root causes of economic and racial inequalities. And in their eyes, funding like this means that they let John down. (laughs) After all, according to the Wall Street Journal, apparently John was a fan of the extractive economy and was known for paying his workers as little as possible and lecturing them on the importance of thrift. So uh, I guess to his family, the idea of spending his money on solving the root causes of economic and racial inequalities just isn't appropriate. (laughs) (laughs) I guess so, Daniel. But, you know, David, at the end, that's just a lot to think about. As always. But think about it. We hope you will. You can find more information on everything we talked about today, as well as links to that citations needed podcast episodes, as well as the full transcript of this show on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend or supporting us at patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast where you can become part of our discord community and also get yourself a sticker we're working with some artists to create some new designs for us and we're excited to send those out to you you can also contact us at our email address it's contact at ashes ashes dot org uh send us your thoughts we appreciate them we are also on all your favorite social media networks at ashes ashes cast Next week, Daniel, I'm sorry to say you're going to have to tackle this episode by yourself. Oh, but David, that's going to leave me feeling really lonely. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do it with you, but that'll be the topic. So spend some time with yourself this week, reach inside, uh, figure out what it's like to be alone, because next week we're going to be remembering that while we may feel alone, we're all in this together. Uh, We hope you'll tune in for that. I don't really have to uh, make any great leap of imagination for this one, David. (laughs) Yeah, you and me both. All right. Well, until then. This is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.